This interview is brought to you in association with Rabobank. Hello and welcome to our Rural Delivery website interviews, where we speak with the people in our primary industries who are helping drive the various sectors. Today we're focusing on dairy and in particular the outlook for the next 12 months with Hayley Moynihan, Director of Dairy Research for New Zealand and Asia with Rabobank International. Hello Hayley, thanks for joining us. Hello Roger. Hayley, you're looking 12 months out. These are kind of the same figures that Fonterra would have been looking at with the, with the payout forecast in the last couple of days. That's right, eh? That is right, and it's really looking at that fundamental demand and supply balance. Where do we see that balance both now and, and over the coming 12 months? And, of course, supply is a, is a little easier to track. Uh, it's more well reported from the, the large exporting countries, but demand is where it really gets challenging. You know, how much are consumers willing to buy and, and at what price in the coming 12 months? And that's what Sontira has said with its payout. Now, at the moment, people tend to focus on that as being, this is what's being given to a farmer. But in many respects, the dairy industry or Fonterra is not a price maker. They have to take what's available in the marketplace. And those high $8 figures, too much. Why? That, that's right. We've seen the global dairy market go from a famine to a feast. Uh, the high $8 payout, there was very little product around globally, including from New Zealand. And it meant buyers were forced to pay those those very high prices unwillingly, but uh, but paid them nonetheless. But conversely, we've seen that turn completely on its head now, where there is product availability from every origin in the world. But consumers have actually taken a breather. They've they've said we don't like these high prices. In some uh, regions, and particularly in some emerging markets, they've actually become accustomed to not having that product available. So. Demand doesn't pick start just because the product's available and that's what we're seeing in the market in terms of very soft prices and that sentiment remaining weak for some time until until consumers really start to pick up uh, in terms of demand growth. And a lot of farmers are going to have to look at what their costs of production are in order to sort of live with this for the next few years, right? That's right. We know volatility is here and it's, and it's here to stay and uh, last season and this season is just primary evidence of that. And it's why uh, being able to survive these periods that you know can be quite prolonged, uh, much of the high prices were prolonged for, for more than 12 months last year, that uh, surviving the lows becomes crucial in terms of having the flexibility to adapt and certainly having that focus on costs, knowing what, uh, what can be trimmed and, uh, and what is sensible, sensible to be trimmed uh, is key. Our cost of production have been creeping up over the years. Where do you sort of see us in a, uh, in a in a global spectrum in terms of what it costs to get a kilo of milk solids off a Kiwi farm versus the competition? Yeah, we, we have lost ground in recent years in terms of that wide comparative advantage that New Zealand farmers had. That said, we're still very definitely competitive. We're just uh, towards the middle of the pack now in terms of competitiveness, particularly when some of our competitors like the US are enjoying particularly low feed costs at the moment. Over the next few years, I think New Zealand's going to continue to be challenged on the cost of production front because we do have farm systems that utilise inputs to a, to a greater degree. Uh, we do have relatively high capital costs in terms of land. Mm. And I think as an industry, we'll also be grappling with the challenge that environmental regulations present over the next few years. So it's not an area we can afford to lose focus on. Yeah, sure. When we look at milk production expanding around the world, are we looking at more people getting into dairy in an area or more intensification, i.e. greater productivity gains in other regions? Yeah, it is a combination. Generally, it's more productivity gains where... Uh, particularly in our larger competitors like Europe and the United States, are uh, gaining economies of scale and, uh, and becoming more intensive and particularly utilising feed. That's definitely the case in the United States and it is making them dramatically more competitive along with the benefits of a, a weaker US dollar on the global market. But we've also got the situation in Europe where after a period of 30 years, the door is finally being opened to, mm -hmm. to greater European milk production with, with those quotas coming off. So that's, a, uh, that's expansion that has been pent up for some time and we'll see that initial release in 2015 and that will definitely have an impact on the market. Mm. Are you seeing that the New Zealand industry, um, farmers in particular, are now taking a, perhaps a keener interest in the demand side after many, many years of looking very closely at what production levels were? 
definitely there's an increased appreciation for what the big markets are doing, and particularly given the, the concentration of product that uh, now goes to China, both from New Zealand and from the global market as a whole, I see that there's a, an increased willingness to want to understand what final form that product ends up in and what consumer trends are occurring with that product. So I think that's a positive, but it is difficult to uh, to get information that, that clearly shows consumer demand and how it's tracking because price increases do have a lagged effect and then the consumer demand impact is further lagged. So we can often see these impacts come three, six or nine months down the track from when we might see commodity prices move. What sort of uh, visibility can, I guess, an individual farming enterprise get in terms of what's happening in terms of consumer megatrends, the type of products people are consuming, how much they're paying for them? That's a, it's a pretty sophisticated world, the FMCG business, certainly. Are there vehicles that, that people can tap into to gain some sort of awareness of where their the type of market their product is going to in that particular at the consumer level? Yeah, it is variable because sometimes dairy increasingly is being used as an ingredient in products. So it's not always visible or even reported through retail channels where uh, we have milk components going into ingredients. So that can become quite tricky. Uh, but even at the broader level, uh, there's good information now. We see the globalization of information where the broader dairy trends around uh, liquid milk consumption, uh, fresh products consumption like yogurt uh, or, or even cheese, is reasonably well reported, even though it may take some time in terms of long data series. But um, but that information is out there. Uh, I think it is just a matter of it can take a little while to find, <laughs> um, and uh, and sifting through the information to find what is really relevant is, is the key aspect. Looking at the big picture of the demand side, we've got two things going on. We've got China we've got more of its own supply. And we've got Russia shutting out Europe, and Europe having to find somewhere else to put its product. In. How's that balancing, given that New Zealand can still get into Russia? Yeah, it can still get into Russia for uh, some products. And it, what has had a bigger impact is that the diversion of that European milk that would have traditionally gone into Russia as cheese is now coming onto the world market in other product forms like milk powder. So that's what's providing buyers with the luxury of choice. And particularly in the absence of China, which has dominated the market for the last 18 months to two years. And what's been telling about that is from the demand side of the equation, we haven't seen those other emerging markets jump back in as we thought you might have, given prices are now at what could be described as bargain levels. So we really need to see that demand reinvigorated and expect those buyers will come back in. They may just take some time about it. With those bargain prices, are people going to be stockpiling? We're going to see people building up a whole lot of inventory now and hanging on to it, and that's causing a lag effect in terms of demand growth in the future? Yeah, we're not seeing it from the demand side so much yet because buyers aren't feeling that urgency. Um, there may be some that opportunistically choose to build inventory, but it's not occurring yet. What we are seeing is some inventory build on the selling or exporting side of the equation where the Russian impact is seeing some inventories build uh, in Europe and particularly in cheese, but we're also expecting to see some inventory build in the US simply because export markets are not that attractive. So products likely to sit there until prices reach a point that it does become attractive. Either way, it does lag the price recovery that we'll see. Mm. That makes it tough for Fonterra to make its forecasts, I'm sure, and the, uh, the political situation tougher still. Still, they have indicated that we're looking at a slow rebuild back up into $7 over the next few years. What sort of data are they looking at there to mean making those calls, do you think? Yeah, it is around those supply volumes and, uh, and expected demand growth expectations. And indeed, it does indicate that a prolonged trough is, is likely to result simply because of the milk volumes coming out of New Zealand, Europe and, and the United States. Timing depends very much on when we see buyers return, and that becomes more subjective um, rather than relying on data. And our expectations are that we won't see a significant lift in, um, in milk prices or commodity prices until we get closer to the third quarter of, of 2015. We've seen a reasonable amount of activity from Fonterra in terms of acquiring supply in the marketplace, China being an obvious example, and we've heard that we have brand launch with regard to Frontier's approach to buying into those selective milk pools over time, with prices low, is that a good time for Frontier to be doing that? 
it, it does vary by market because, of course, prices aren't low uh, in all markets at the moment. There is a disjoint in the global market where we still see you know, very high milk prices in places like China for domestic production. And even in markets like the United States where a tighter market fundamentals still mean that fund gate prices are very high in the U.S. So um, it is a case of taking markets for their own local factors as well rather than necessarily changing decisions because the, the global market overall is, is in a trough at present. Right, so they have to take a bigger picture approach. I guess at any time you're buying into these milk pools, you're doing that for the long term. Absolutely. It's a it's a very long-term proposition, and particularly on the production side of the equation, and, uh, and that's why it is looking through that current market situation, even though these markets are, are much more buoyant than the international market is at present. Okay, well, it looks like a case of steady as she goes. Hayley, we'll keep in touch. We'll catch up with you next quarter. Look forward to reading the full report. Thank you, Roger. This interview was brought to you in association with Rabobank.